morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the ITC Asia podcast in partnership with Selen. Today, we are looking at something incredibly important to the insurance industry worldwide, data management. And to help us along this journey, we have got some fantastic speakers for you who are going to introduce themselves now. So first up, we'll start with Sylvie. Great to have you here. How are you doing? Why don't you introduce yourself to the people listening at home? Hi Merlin, great to be here. Hi everyone, I'm Sylvie Wampa Sinclair. I work for Swiss Re, where I'm globally responsible for portfolio underwriting, and with that comes a lot of data questions. Great to be here. Great to have you here, uh, Max. Uh, great to have you here. Why don't you introduce yourself to the uh, to the listeners? Hello, I'm Max. I'm um, insurance technology research lead for the APEC region at Salon. So we publish insights into the financial technology research and provide our insights into the markets in general and itself. Yeah. And last but not least, Teresa, amazing that you can join us. Introduce yourself to our listeners. Hello, everyone. My name is Teresa. I come from Taiwan, a life insurance company. Uh, so far, I'm in charge of my uh, digital transformation and our corporate uh, strategy tra- uh, planning. Thanks for you uh, inviting me. Thank you. It's really wonderful to have you here. Well, without further ado, let's kick off. start is looking at the differences in how we approach or the different challenges that we see in in, in terms of data between Europe and in Asia as well. So Sylvie, why don't you uh, maybe not speak to both, but talk about some of the challenges that you face from from a European perspective? Absolutely. And given that you raised the question of geographics, um, I guess I would make the comparison between Europe and the US where um, I, I think, first of all, data availability uh, in the US is is different, and I would I would say better compared to Europe. You have more public filings in the US, which uh, makes data capture easier um, than what is often the case in Europe. Um, otherwise, I think it's. Um, on an even keel um, in many ways, but I think we we do face many of the same challenges with which technology to use for what, and then of course user adoption and the cultural angles of data. But I think the public filings do make a big difference between the Europe and and the US. Uh, Max, why don't you talk us through some of the challenges from a, from a data perspective that you see in uh, in Asia across the board? I think one of the main challenges is the, the silos of systems. Um, so oftentimes in doing our research, we'll come across um, case studies whereby a company is trying to integrate into a standard data lake. There are successful cases, but it's always attempting to bring together all the data so that they are able to, you know, showcase a model development process based on the integrated data that they are they require. So I would say data integration, data management is always some of the common challenges as well as adhering to the regulations of each specific country, which is quite pertinent, especially to Asia, where each country has specific kind of nuances of how data is being processed or procured or even to use. Yeah. Uh, Teresa, as, as we kind of move on here, Something that I've always gleaned from uh, from conversations around data in, in in my role is looking at the data that's that's actually important to your to your business and and looking at those those data points that are actually going to help you achieve you know your business goals. I mean, how first first question I suppose how important is it to find that data, but also kind of maybe taking a step back. How do you make that decision? How do you make that choice of, you know, here's useful data, here's data that we actually don't need to to analyze as much. Well, what 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 does the process look like that? Okay, uh, I think all kind of data brings information, no matter is uh, useful or not. In my experience, uh, in my experience for the business model, uh, even directly support uh, support our maybe the uh, life insurance company for the monetization from data. However, I think the uh, key success for it uh, depends on a well-organized form or well-governed government uh, platform. 
the key is the data governance and the data scientist. Uh, maybe the data science uh, well, or we will approach to the AI. Uh, I, I, I will give you an example. Last year is our Cassetta Life's 60th anniversary. How to make it from data to uh, information to knowledge. knowledge. Uh, we just try to do it. And we think the good data governance and the discover insights from the data leverage, the scale of our business model. For some player, we saw, uh, we saw this mechanism for, uh, for data. Uh, so far, there are 30 players in Taiwan, but we, we, uh, we find not every competitor will, will have the, this great governance platform. I think it's the burden from them to facing uh, their data. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that, that sort of piques my interest a little bit. And see, we kind of want, to, want you to come in on this point because you and I have spoken a few times before, and I know that you're doing some interesting things at Swiss Re, um, spe specifically within the cat space, if memory serves, uh, around you know, looking at, you know, data for, for, for different risk pools and how that changes your approach to to, to funding those risk pools and, and, and how, how you apply capital to them. Um, I'd, I'd be interested to get your thoughts as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's the, the question of, you know, what what data is important to begin with, because I think it's an important one. I think it's it's way too easy for people to say, oh, yes, give me more, um, because it's, it's you know, that's the standard knee-jerk reaction. Um, I think the simple question of why, you know, why, why do you want this data is, is, a, is a magnificently powerful one. And, and actually also asking, if you had to pay for this data yourself, would you actually use it for for underwriting um and and that often helps us triage a little bit what is a must have and and what is a, a nice to have um because i think we've all sort of gotten charmed a little bit by by data and, and not all of us also realize the cost of taking more um, data on board but coming back to your to your question merlin about what we are doing indeed we are um, something we are sort of working on hard at the moment is actually using third party market data um, for what we call our forward looking views. So basically for the risk pools that we underwrite, what is going to happen going forward, moving that from a, a pretty much manual exercise of humans scraping various websites and, and data um, sources today to a, a an automated approach. Um, I think that shows us the power um, of of data, um, but it also shows the some of the the shortcomings and the fact that yes, there is a lot we can automate and and want to automate, but it does not remove the need for human judgment of of what is valuable and where are the um, where are the correlations real and and where is their spurious accuracy so i think more than more than anything we see the benefit of automation but we also see the continued need for a human brain or several human brains in the process um, max perhaps you could come in on this um we're seeing recently, you know, at the end of the last year, we saw innovations like ChatGPT, for example, where a lot of people uh, were using it for, for, you know, for all kinds of things, you know, looking at content or, 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 or kind of scraping the internet to, to kind of get a really quick uh, article to, to, to put on some kind of social. Um, I mean, Sylvie, and, and I agree with you there, Sylvie, mentions that there's, there's, there's still a need for a human, uh, you know, a human brain, human innovation, human in human kind of interaction in these decision making processes. Do you perhaps think that at some point we might see now this is very forward thinking, very futuristic, uh, you know, I robot minority reports report style question. But do you think at some point we we might see a 
um, you know, a, a situation in which the the human need is is no longer needed, you know, as much as you know perhaps it is now. No, I think the human need is still pretty much important, especially for very niche industry like you know if you talk about financial services or even insurance. Um, because just on experiencing chat GPT myself, I found out that there are certain information chat GPT won't be able to answer. Like if you ask them who is the better vendor and so on, they won't have the information, but they can tell you generally speaking with fairly good English and so on, what is insurance industry, what is all this and so, and so go on, so on, so on and so forth. So it's a very general picture that they give today, but I'm not you know, saying in the near future that we, you know, we be eliminated because the computer can do a better job than us. But in the meantime, a lot of the domain knowledge still holds at the hand of the human mind. Um, even you talk about, let's say, an ML ops process, whenever we want to do an iteration or checkbacks, we will still go back to the business users and ask them, does my model make sense to you? Does my results make sense to the, the challenges that you are trying to solve today? So the human in the loop is still pretty much important, especially for very niche domain industries. Uh, uh I mean, we, we sort of moved this uh, question or, or this conversation quite artfully into uh, in, into kind of looking at AI right now. And it's very hard these days to have a conversation about data and not bring in uh, some very nice shiny new tech um, that, uh, that, that, that AI is, relatively speaking. Um, Teresa, um how useful have have you found it for, for ai you know, if at all um how useful have you found ai for getting insights data insights from data i mean especially now after there's been some probably increased investment in the insurance industry over the past few years mm. okay uh i think not uh not trials come out a successful outcome we pursue a quick win in small scale inspired so I will give you two about uh, our companies, how to do the AI application. The one uh, we call the Kasei AI. Uh, what's the Kasei AI? Uh, Kasei AI, so uh, we can, sorry, we, we can, uh, Kasei AI is a data-driven and AI-powered risk model. So we can put the every, uh, every customer, one customer, one score the uh, utilized over uh, 440 input variables across eight categories of insurance data. So our uh, machine learning algorithm generates a more precise risk rating and a more target customer segmentation. Um, so far, we implement this tool to our underwriter and our Thai agent uh, layer marketing very well. But the first, uh, at the early stage, how could, uh, could we cooperate with the underwriter and uh, our Thai agent? Uh, we want to learn believe this product, but everybody knows uh, they, they are very experienced well uh, in their daily life. Uh, I'm the agent, so I know how to sell. Uh, I, I know my customer well than your, your AI tell me. So uh, we put a lot of the communication and uh, education uh, to let them believe this is work for, for them. So one, well, one is uh, we say the KSAI. In the same uh, logic, we develop the other uh, tool. We say the KSAM, AIM. So we have the, uh, so far we have the largest agents, Thai agents in Taiwan. We have uh, 26,000 agents. So every agent uh, has more than 200 customers and they need to visit them uh, at least one time a year. But everybody knows how to make it efficiency we are with lay to, uh, to fit our customer needs and the company's per, uh, protect, uh, per view. So we want to make the win-win situation between companies. Uh, maybe we have the margin, margin goal and the agent have their sales goal. So how to combine this is uh, in the same time. So we put uh, KSA M into our agent's CRM system to reshape their uh, data-driven culture uh, for our agent. So we let them believe that uh, the, the name this team uh, recommend from AI more useful than their experience.
I mean, there's, there's, there's quite an interesting couple of projects that you've mentioned there. And we, we, we looked at the difference between data management in, in Europe and Asia at the start. Sylvie, if you're, you're hearing what, what Teresa said there, do you think that something like that would you know, be possible in a European setting? Or do you see some kind of challenges that, that would stop um, you know, a, a European based insurer or even a US based insurer, for example, um, you know, having, having those kind of outcomes? No, um, I mean, technology is technology and, and humans are humans, no matter no matter where you go. Um, look, I think from from what I've seen, I mean, to date, if, if you look at, you know, AI, I think what, what where we have seen great results or very promising results is some of the more, I guess, sort of mechanistic um, exercises. So for instance, extracting information from old files. So, you know, be that, you know, your your handwritten note or your PDF or your messy Excel, you know, take, take your pick, right? And I think that's where we've seen scaling with AI work very, very well. Um, Coming back to to what I mentioned earlier about sort of market trends and so on, I think yes, we see great value again in the in the mechanistic automation and removing that from the sort of the hands of the humans. But I think where we do see um, limitations as yet is when when you have more of that uh, forecasting. So saying okay, based on having seen this in the past. We also think this is what it's going to look like going forward. And I think that's still where AI sometimes goes wrong um, because it it doesn't always get what is correlation and what is causality. And, and that's where sometimes the human still needs to step in. But look, I'm an optimist. So I think, you know, with time you can you can overcome that too. But I but I think those shortcomings are probably the same wherever you go in, in the world today. Uh, I mean, we we we're we're all optimists in uh, in in this world. I think I think everyone on this podcast is is probably very forward thinking. Um, but I, 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 Max, I would be curious to get uh, an idea of a, of a specific challenge or, or specific barrier that perhaps you have heard in 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 the Asian market in terms of implementation. You know, we. What we what we often do is we you know we get very excited about a new bit of kit a new bit of tech, um, but then sometimes it takes a long time to implement or all the project fails in its entirety. I mean the the statistic is still floating around that uh, it's you know ten percent of uh, only ten percent of machine learning data science projects actually come to fruition globally. Um, but Max, is there something? Is there, are there any barriers to implementing AI? or to implementing any technology actually in, in Asia that you've seen constantly, you know, arise when people are engaging in these projects? I think there are successful cases as well as those um, not so good cases, but one of the challenges is to find the right data. Like I think it's mentioned by Sylvia and Teresa as well, is that how do you pick the right data that can address the right challenge uh, and then with the right models and so on. So this is actually always an ongoing um, kind of problem. And the other part is because from my experience in, in the Asian market is that whenever you do an innovation for like AI ML, how do you scale that so that it can go into production line and then make it work for the whole like value chain? And so what I mean by this is that if you can create a model, but if you're unable to relate it to the real world kind of scenario, it's quite hard for you know, in the business users to actually use it. So that's another challenge. And the other thing is more on like data literacy in organization. Sometimes, even up to today, um, you may find instances whereby you may want to implement data initiative, but the company is just not ready um, based on the kind of talent that they have. And so one of the ways that I, I always try to you know promote is more like, so we take a step back of the technical items. We look at the people themselves in the culture sense. How do we empower the organization so that they actually understand the tools that they are being given? So that's why data literacy as a kind of foundational uh, kind of a solution may be the way forward um, instead of talking about you know let's look for the best news use cases today and then try to solve it um, you're not solving the business issue you're, you're actually you're just solving a, a kind of fun science challenge so it's always lo looking at 
first the insurance value chain itself what are the kind of use cases that we can plug out from and then implement the right talent and how do we train that talent so that we can empower the whole organization to to take on on board new skills as well as to grow together and innovate on on a scale that is more meaningful rather than just a particular silos use case yeah uh, I want to pick up on something there, which is you mentioned, which is data literacy, and um, there's there's something that I'm keen to 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 understand from uh, from 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 this podcast, which is looking at looking at a data culture, and uh, I know Sylvie has to uh, ha- has to run off unfortunately and leave us, but I just wonder if you could just give us a quick and uh, Teresa, I, I, I want to hear your thoughts on this as well in terms of data culture. Um, Sylvie, I mean, how how do you make sure that everyone's pulling in the same direction and that they are willing to embrace a, a, a datafied culture, so to speak? Yeah, look, look, I don't think there's one size fits all here in terms of solutions. But I think what we've done is we've, we've sort of combined ambassadorship and and, you know, learning from successes with a more broad based um, educational program at at many levels of of seniority in the company. So I think we've started out with sort of repeatedly and and regularly showcasing success stories that, you know, that usually early adopters have delivered. And we use that as a way to inspire others who who may still be more you know, doubtful as to whether this would make sense for them too. And and by doing that on a regular basis, you kind of get the inspiration out there. And then from from below, we also put um, pretty much, you know, not everybody, but but a good chunk of our people through data literacy training. Um, And not meaning that everybody will become a data scientist, but giving more people the tools for thinking, okay, I've got this business problem. How can data or or analytics help me? And more importantly, who should I reach out to on the tech side to get it looked at or sorted? Um, So I think it's it's a multi-pronged approach where nothing sort of fits everyone. um, But but I think you've got to try many different things in parallel. Mm. And uh, Teresa, I'm going to come to you as Sylvie. Uh, Sylvie now has to jump off, but we've been very lucky to have you for uh, for the time that we have, Sylvie. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank um, you, everyone. Yeah, to, to, to... Uh, Teresa, I'd be keen to hear your thoughts. I saw you nodding along there, um, which uh, which which is usually a good sign. But yeah, why don't you uh, talk us through that 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 kind of instilling a data culture and looking at uh, the data literacy of of employees and and, and etc. Okay, uh, so far I totally agree with Sylvie and Max. Uh, I think the cultural in my company, uh, the key successful factor one is top down. Second is education. Yeah, so uh, why is the top down? Uh, we said uh, we have already started our this digital transformation journey about four years ago. So far, we said the Warren, Warren, Warren cultural. Well, Warren cultural uh, for me uh, to, to create the agile, agile, agile squad. So uh, we will set the Warren's goal, empower our PO and the squad team member to achieve it. So far, the top down, we created an innovative environment, no matter from the design experiment, do and see, or modify uh, what we did uh, every day. So from all kinds of the feedback. Uh, so far, we, uh, as we belong to a financial group, not only uh, life insurance, uh, but also our bank or PNC, we all uh, compromise this top-down c- culture. So we, be, uh, we believe uh, repeated the actions so that we can enhance our capability. It means we can identify risk better and create better experience. So uh, that's why I say one is top-down. The second is education. We did the CASE uh, Data Science Academy three years ago. Uh, that, that was the amplifier to reshape data-driven culture. The purpose is very simple. We just want to let us uh, domain insurance expert or our uh, digital team or data team, we put them together. 
we, do, uh, we put the, uh, put them together to have the basic knowledge, and we want to create the same language. So uh, we design series of, about the education program to improve data scientist ability to our uh, domain insurance expert from BU. So this program focus on uh, so far we have uh, said twenty uh, percent of our domain employees have this uh, fundamental knowledge of of data uh, data science. Well, that's a really interesting note to end on, that data culture piece, uh, hugely important as we know that sometimes is that not having not not focusing on the the people element element of technology can often result in a well a a tricky implementation of the project um my last note is to thank all of our guests sylvie uh, Teresa, and max for joining us today fascinating discussing this with you all we will be looking at many topics like this at itc asia in singapore on the 30th yeah. of may to the 1st of june so make sure you grab your ticket or get in touch to see how you can get involved uh, thank you very much to all of our guests today. Uh, have uh, well, you guys have a great evening, and uh, I will endeavour to have a great rest of my day as it starts very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice day.